My next guest I'm always happy to have on this show. This is a most talented gentleman who has not only directed some of the most powerful plays and movies of our time, outstanding films, uh, Gentleman's Agreement, On the Waterfront, Viva Zapata, East of Eden, which is quite a list of credits, but his current novel called Acts of Love is his fourth book to reach the bestseller list. Great pleasure to welcome Ilya Kazan. Congrats. I understand it's already uh, poking up there. and uh, Yeah, it's on the bestseller list. That must be a great satisfaction because you uh, you started writing relatively late in life. I mean, most writers start as kids and, mm. you know, and are writing in their, in their teens. But you didn't start until your, your early 50s, right? I was talking to artists out there. She's yeah. watching the show, by the way. And I said to her, why is it that you, uh, oh, the you, you took this up? And yeah. She says... Uh, uh, I was more nervous doing the show with Johnny than I was jumping. So I said, it didn't look like it. And, and I said, why did you do this? She says, I want to do everything in life. Now, I think that's a great... Uh, Isn't that it's... remarkable? I want to do everything. That's exactly what she said. Yeah, I think it's... And that's why I started writing books, if you want to know. I know. Yeah, writing, uh, from the people I have talked with, Truman Capote and uh, Irvin Shaw, any of the writers that I know, say it's a lonely type of profession, at least when you're directing a picture, you're out there and you have a lot of creativity going around you, you have mm -hmm. mercurial personalities to deal with, there's, a, there's a, a, a lot of electricity going on, but when you write, you're in a room or by yourself, you got the paper, the typewriter, you're, the, and it's I've, a I've very... I've never had any trouble with, uh, with a blank page or writers, what do they call it, writer's block or anything like mm -hmm. that, but uh, as you get older, you get more interested in yourself, you get more interested in your own problems, and... Uh, you like to live in the country. When you write, you can travel and write every morning in Paris or Athens or wherever you are. And it's a better life as you get older, Johnny. Yeah? Yeah. But you do, do you find it as uh, more challenging than, say, directing? I think it's it? harder. I yeah. think it's a lot harder because you have no one to help you. You don't have that input from you other... You know, you make a picture, everybody's <coughs> out to help you. The crew, yeah. the cameraman, the cutter, they're all there, you know, telling you that's not right. You can do this better. Why don't you do it this way and everything like that. And, but uh, writing a book, you're out there at the end of a long limb all by yourself, and uh, you hope you're doing right. There's always that cliche about everyone has a book in them, which may be true. Of course, the trick is is to put that book down on paper so that it yeah. makes sense and is readable and has a certain style. And, uh, right, right. And, and, and then to do to it, it over again, Johnny, and then to do it over again. And I made seven drafts of Acts of Love. <laughs> that is the thing. I, I notice when I, when I write, if I write a routine or something, I'm doing something, I find if I write it and come back later, it seems to have cooled. And what you thought was originally very good at the moment of Absolutely. conception does not seem so great the following morning or the following day. You read it again. Do you think so there's sometimes a danger of picking something almost apart there is, yeah. Uh, and losing what yeah. you originally had. Yeah. Rather, the, the, the instinct was right to begin with. Yes. And by trying to get the right word or the right phrase that you maybe... Yes. But on the other hand, if you don't do it, you find that you're saying things over again that, that you said before. Right. Or that you're explaining something that doesn't need explanation. I don't like writers that nudge you all the time and saying, you should think this or you should think that or you should... This is what I mean by what I'm saying. I like the audience or the reader in this case to make up their own mind. And, yeah. But uh, um, I had a very tough editor on this, and he was very uh, ruthless with me. And uh, I got to love him. I thought he was marvelous because he was so damn tough with me. Well, that's the discipline that you give to actors when you direct them. They yeah. need that. I suppose an editor yeah. serves the same function, right? Right, exactly. As a, as a good editor. Exactly. Are you one of those people who, and I wish I had this habit, I don't, of putting things down when you think of them, even if it's on a piece of paper and throwing them into a box or something. So later on, you do this. <laughs> I wish I had that discipline. Everything. Because then when you get to ready to write a book, or you, yeah. because the memory sometimes uh, is not that reliable, and you try to conjure up something, uh, particularly in a yeah. conversation or something, it was very amusing. Yeah. And once you let it go, yeah. it's hard to recreate. So you just... Well, you also train yourself to observe yeah. things and to put them down. And one advantage of putting everything down is that you begin to observe things that you otherwise would not observe. And all kinds of little things... So, for example, are, let me yeah, interrupt. Freddie DeCordova, our producer, was telling there. me before the show, he mm -hmm. says, you know... I went downstairs before the show, and I saw Gad sitting there, and I said, what do you mean sitting where? He said, well, he was sitting in my chair over here. I said, what was he doing? He said he was looking at the audience coming in. Yeah. And he asked you about it, and you said, well, you found this very interesting, the people coming in, just yes. the general uh, feeling in the audience of coming yeah. in to see a television show, and you were observing it from, from that standpoint. Nothing personal, but I thought, what a wonderful setting for a murder mystery. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Murder think on the Tonight Show. You got a novel there working. No, I'm not going to do that. I've been killed a few times on this show already, but... <laughs> No, has, no, there ever, but, has there ever been a setting in which... No, I, know. I suppose there's been shows within the framework as of As the body business. falls, the band plays. And, <laughs> 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 and then we move the corpse down and bring out the next guest. <laughs> and just leave him on the couch. Let me interrupt for a commercial. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're talking with uh, Ilya Kazan. Yeah. I've also heard uh, a rule of thumb, if you're going to write a book, one should write about a subject with which he is, has some familiar or has something draw, to draw upon. And in your book, Acts of Love, it's uh, about a, a young woman who obtains a certain degree of self-knowledge through her uh, abundant use of sexuality, I guess it would be a fair way to... A nicer way with her associations with a group of men, a series yeah. of men, a series of men. Yes, uh, and well... you said, I think you had about nine women in mind when you wrote the book? God, did I say that? Or something like that, something. yeah. <laughs> well, Do women no. come to you when they read the book? That's another thing that authors get. Hey, were you talking about me in this? Yes, they've done that. Sure. They've come up to me on the street now. The book seems to touch women more than men. And I think part of it is because it's a woman's view of men and uh, how much men hide in their lives that's revealed in the moment of making love. In other words, uh, men go through their whole lives hiding things, and when they make love, all of a sudden it's visible to a woman. I knew, uh, I knew a girl once that uh, uh, had been the girlfriend of a, a real heavy hood, a gangster, a, a uh, member of the so-called uh, underworld. Yes, and she said in the, moment of, uh, in the moment of his climax, he would call out, Mama, Mama, explain that to me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you sure it wasn't Mamma Mia? <laughs> I don't know. I better be wrong. No, I suppose. No, but you know, you become childish. What? You become childish, childish. because you're. It's a vulnerable. Unguarded. It's a vulnerable situation. Yes. And you are completely open, open in all respects at that time. That's right. No, and I, I mean, I suppose that is a childlike. Uh, right. They say the same thing when people are close to death, or when somebody Don't dies. They would yell. Schultz was dying. Schultz was dying. He's my mama, mama too. Yeah. yeah. And I guess that's very basic. We're not so equating you... sex with death, I don't think. Oh, exactly. no, I don't think so. No. I wouldn't do that. Johnny. But anyway, you know, when you're a director of films and plays, as I've been for many, many years, you meet so many uh, young actresses who want to get into the business. And they start talking to you so quickly because they want you to know that they're full of... Uh, juice, experience, passion, unfulfilled feelings, and all the rest of it. And before you know it, you're hearing their biography. In five minutes, they're telling you what, why they ran away from home, how much they hate their mother, and all that. So sooner or later, it all gets in the book. Yeah. <laughs> would you find, say, a young male actor, they would be more guarded, in other words? More guarded. More guarded, yes. They're more on the, more on the defensive. They, uh, I think women talk more easily or more readily about... Uh, the natural things of existence, I mean, the human relationships. Do you think that? I mean, what's your... I think, yeah, I think men probably talk more, uh, quote, locker room talk about the physical act in itself, where women would talk about the relationship, the, the, love the tenderness, yeah, the, uh, right. the uh, vulnerability, the, the romance of it, equating it more with that. I, I may be wrong, I don't know. I've heard women also sit around and talk about... Uh, <laughs> No, I have, sitting around talking so about I. it, you know, like, guys doesn't think that happens, but sitting around saying, hey, I heard that so-and-so was uh, terrible, or equating uh, yeah. the various guys yeah. and their uh, uh, proficiency and et cetera. So, <laughs> and I think Kinsey in a lot of his surveys found that uh, what a lot of men thought was not true. We sure have been doing some good tiptoeing in our vocabulary. Uh, well, yes, it's like walking along the Grand Canyon. You have to be very careful. You don't want to be too crass about this, but yeah. it is true. Do you think huh? then women, you would say, were probably more open about their sexuality? Uh, I, I so, and also men. about all human relationships with children and everything else. And men to, seem to me to talk more about uh, business or deals they've made or uh, their scores and uh, oh, uh, what their future is or how much money they have or have not got, what they want or what they lost. And hell, it's boring after a while. Yeah. But with, with women, they talk about their husbands and their mothers, their fathers, their children, what their hopes are, and all the deeper, more uh, interesting things you know, in the life. Human relations. The human relations. It was a Gorby doll who once said you can tell more about a man uh, about 
what he really is about his attitude toward uh, money, sex, and death. Sex and death, yes. He says those three things uh, really reveal, uh, the man's attitude towards those three things really reveal what he is. And there's a lot of truth in it, you think, so, yeah. of people who are afraid of death, people who say, I'm not afraid, I'm ready anytime. And, and money, of course, is a very revealing thing, don't you think? I mean, how, what people's relation to money is. And, yeah. And sex, of course. Yeah, that's true. There are people who, sometimes you have more money and it's never enough. Never enough. Uh, it becomes, becomes a... An end in itself. Uh, yeah. of it. And uh, all during the 60s, the kids were rebelling against the idea of accumulation of money as a goal in life. And uh, my kids did too. And all during the 60s. And all that whole revolt was against the idea that that was the end in life, to accumulate money. Yeah, but yet when you're growing up, that quote is the American dream, to be successful and... Yeah. And... Uh, become uh, maybe not wealthy but well to do or whatever and that was the dream but that, somebody that in and itself is not particularly bad i suppose it's what you do with it when you get it and how you use it somebody said that uh, success is harder to deal with than failure but of course that must have been a uh, that must have been a uh, 